question. In bigger. Uh, anyway, so maybe it's just lagging, but uh, let me start. So um, thank you for the introduction, um, Dr. Paitun. Let me tell more about myself uh, for the benefit of those who were not in my first session last month. I'm Ruen Alcoba. As Professor Bunanang said, I'm an alumna of NIDA, graduated in 2019 with a doctoral degree in development administration, and Professor Bunanan was my advisor then. I'm from the Philippines, been here in Thailand for almost 20 years now. I'm currently an advisor to Supratarka. This is an international NGO based in Japan. And I teach the International College of Chiang Mai Rajabat University. And I'm also an adjunct faculty at St. Robert's Global Education, teaching masters and doctoral students. I used to work at the Asian Institute of Technology in Bangkok. It's a postgraduate research institute. I worked there for more than a decade, holding various posts such as senior program officer and learning portfolio manager. My research interests are in the areas of public service, motivation, organizational politics, social entrepreneurship, and internationalization of higher education. In the past three years, I have published three articles in Scopus Journal and co-authored chapters in two books and an ebook on Asian case studies uh, in collaboration with University Technology Petronas in Malaysia. Um, the title and links of this literature are listed in the Google Scholar. And I'm also a reviewer in some journals currently. To start off, I'd like to see a raise of hand here, okay? I want to know at what stage are you now with your research? Are you still at the beginning stage, exploring topic, or maybe contemplating to do research? Can you please uh, click the raise hand button so we can see? Who are in the you know, beginning stage, still exploring topic? Maybe contemplating on whether you would do research. So one already raised his hand. Two. Three. All right. How about those who are already doing research work? Maybe you are in the literature review stage or data collection or interpretation. We have one here, two, three. All right. Anyone who has already completed research work and now in the process of article submission. Maybe you are looking for journals to submit or you are already writing an article. Oh, we have two. Or are these the same people? Stage three, completed research work and in the process of article submission. All right, okay. So um, no matter which stage you are in now, I hope that uh, you will learn a thing or two from this lecture. The topics I will cover will touch these three stages. So these are the topics that will be discussed in the next one to one and a half hours. I will start with explaining the different types of research and then proceed to the research process focusing on formulating and clarifying the research topic. Then I will talk about publishing your paper, the different types of journal, writing for the journal, uh, and the process of paper submission. 
I will also share personal experience and insights uh, and in publishing in a Scopus journal. So the materials and information for this seminar were derived from textbooks, website platforms of journals and journal indexing bodies. I also derived materials from Dr. Kantabutra's lecture on how to continuously publish in quality international journals. Research can be classified into many different types. There's the researcher-driven research, which is determined by the curiosity of researchers and carried out by their expertise. So with this research, you know, the researcher thinks about something that they are interested in and then start coming up with research questions and then investigate and test. The problem with this is that you don't know if what you are trying to do is really original or not because there may be some other solutions to this type of problem already. So this type of research will be difficult to publish in a quality journal, if that is the case. Then there's the problem-driven research, which begins not with collection of data or facts or with clarification of concepts, but with identification of inconsistencies or gaps in existing knowledge. You know, we have many problems that we can see around us. There's a sustainability problem, organizational management problem. These are okay, but you have to be aware that the research or solution is original enough. For example, the problem of managing change in organization, this kind of topic has been around for a few decades now. So if you are going to do this research to solve a problem of organizational change in your organization, this is not new. So it may be difficult to publish in top tier journals. Another type is the replication of previous research. This is basically conducting the research which has been originally done by someone in another country and then you just replicate it with a different research population or maybe with a different industry. So it's basically just replicating other people's work. It is difficult to get published in quality journal. It's okay if you are just a master's student, but if you are a PhD student, um, this may not be acceptable to your advisor. So it actually depends on your purpose for doing research. But if you want to publish in quarter two or two, one or two journals, you can do literature derived research. The research questions for this type are derived from gaps from literatures. I mean, global literature, because we are aiming at international journal. So we look at what theories other people have put forward and what have been tested. Yes? Is there any question? I think someone's mic is open. Okay, let me continue. Um, yeah. So what does uh, literature-driven research mean? It means that the author extends a previous study. Okay, so um, a study has been done elsewhere and it is extended by you with a new factor or a new variable. Or you extend a study that has been done elsewhere but also has your own theoretical concepts for other people to explore. And this type will add more citation because if you only extend a study done elsewhere and you report the empirical findings, then that's it. In the next few years, there will be no one interested in the study anymore. But if you add a theoretical concept to this paper, your paper can continue to attract the attention of other scholars and it will continue to be cited in the future. 
you can also develop your own theory based on previous studies. And you can test it to make it more robust. However, theory building is a big field. And it's difficult to do theory building. And it's not actually advisable for junior scholars and even PhD students to start with. Uh, maybe this is something that can be done uh, as you go on to your career. So what is an original research? An original research is not just a replication of previous study. It contributes new knowledge instead of summarizing what is already known in a new form. So for example, the study on organizational culture that leads to productivity and more money. This study has been around for many years, okay? But not too many people have talked about organizational culture sustainability performance. And in the screen, you will see the article of Dr. Kantabutra, which was published in 2020 on corporate sustainability in Thai SME. This is an example of regional research that challenges the domain theory on organizational culture. So what are the benefits of producing an original research? More people will be interested in reading your article and more journals would like to publish it. And there will be more citations, of course. And with more citations, um, you can become an authority in the area. In conducting original research, it is essential that it is connected to existing studies. So you don't. Um, come up with something out of nowhere, okay? Your study should build on existing theories or concepts to challenge, to examine, or to confirm. As Professor Burton said here, it's important that authors try to connect their ideas, their issue, and their topic to something that is existing. It may be to challenge that, or maybe to confirm it, it may be to re-examine it, or to indicate why. Whichever way they want to engage with it, it's crucial that people take that time and thought to do that. So that is according to Professor Len Barton, of, uh, the founding editor of Disability and Society. This diagram shows the whole research process, consisting of multiple scientific steps in conducting the research work. Each step is interlinked with other steps. I will not be explaining all these steps, but instead focus on the first two. And in the end, I will give some tips on uh, these steps, okay? So if you are undertaking your research project as part of a course study, the most important attribute will be that it meets the examining body's requirements, and in particular, that it is at the correct level. So if you are in PhD, doing your PhD studies, you cannot do uh, small studies that is done by master students that will not be acceptable to your advisor then your research topic must be something that you are capable of undertaking and one that excites your imagination. Capability can be considered in a variety of ways, you know, like at the professional level, no personal level, you need to feel comfortable that you have the skills that will be required to research the topic. You also have to find the financial and time resources to undertake the research. You should have the capability of gaining access to any data that you might need to collect. And it is of importance, great importance, that the topic has strong theoretical underpinnings. 
just like what Burton uh, mentioned. You will need to have a knowledge of the literature and to do further reading in order, in order to properly define your research questions and objectives. And finally, it is important to consider your career goals. If you wish to become an expert in a particular subject area or industry sector, it is sensible to use the opportunity to develop this expertise. So where to look at for research topic? When you conduct a quick review of literature in search of research topic, focus on the recommendations for future research to identify gaps which you may pursue to study. So these recommendations for future research can be found at the last part of a journal article at the conclusion section. So look at that and look at specific areas where there are repeated calls or recommendations to investigate into and repeated claims that there is little study and meager literature. And of course, you can also always uh, seek advice from your advisor and experts. Now, even if you already have a research idea, it is still necessary to refine it in order to turn it into a research project. This process is called preliminary study, which is done by reviewing some of the related literature like journal articles, books, research studies. So you, you test your research idea, if it is feasible and worthwhile. So here is a checklist. Uh, you can see if your topic is something with which you are really fascinated, if it is within the time frame, if uh, you have the funding to finish the project, and if you can gain access to data. On appropriateness, you can test if the topic fits the specifications of your university, if your topic contains issues that have a clear link to theory. You are able to state your research questions and objectives clearly and to provide fresh insights into the topic. If your topic relate clearly to the idea that you have been given, if you are conducting a research for your organization and if it is symmetrical, meaning it's a similar value, whatever the outcome, All right? Um, before I proceed, can I request uh, whoever is still open the microphone to please mute it? Yes. Okay, thank you. So to continue, I can still hear. Yes, yeah. All right. Yeah, to continue. One of the attributes of a good topic is clearly defined research questions and objectives. The importance of defining clear research questions at the beginning of the research process cannot be overemphasized. This was also mentioned by Professor Bunanan earlier. So one of the key criteria of your research success will be whether you have a set of clear conclusions drawn from the data you have collected. The extent to which you can do that will be determined largely by the clarity with which you have posed your initial 
research questions. So the success of your research is anchored to your research questions. Now, how do you write research questions? Are you familiar with Goldilocks? Yeah, so remember how Goldilocks tried the three bears porridge? One was too hot, one was too cold, and one was just right. So the just right porridge is the one that Goldilocks ate. The Goldilocks test can be used to decide if research questions are either too big, too small, too hot, or just right. Those that are too big pro probably need significant research funding or maybe longer time to finish. Questions that are too small are likely to be of insufficient substance. Example, if your question is what proportion of families are affected by the lockdown, this is too small compared to what are the effects of COVID-19 lockdowns on maternal mental health and parenting practices by urban green space. Okay. Or another problem could be the topic is too hot. Maybe so because of sensitivities that may be aroused as a result of doing research. It can be too risky, for example, doing a study on corrupt practices in government. Research questions that are just right are those that are just right for investigation at this time by this researcher in this setting. Okay. The pitfall that you must avoid at all costs is asking research questions that will not generate new insights or new knowledge. And this again, go back to the question of the extent to which you have consulted the relevant literature. So your question should not be too big, too small, too hot, not too easy or too difficult, or have been answered before. All right. These are some examples of research ideas and their derived focused research questions. I don't know why I cannot make this bigger. Hmm. Can you see it, the screen? The text. You can see your okay, very good. So yeah, these are some examples of research ideas and their derived focus research questions. If your idea is, you know, something about entrepreneurship and COVID pandemic, your general focus research question could be: what are the challenges that the COVID pandemic has posed for entrepreneurs and the strategies adapted to cope? If you have some ideas about, you know, a research risk communication during COVID pandemic, you want to research on this area. The general focus question could be how do LGUs or local government units communicate amidst the current pandemic? If your uh, research idea is on internationalization of higher education, the focused research question could be, how does the student's perception of institutional practices in managing internationalization affect their academic performance and satisfaction? Now, on writing research objectives, researchers sometimes use research questions instead of research objectives, or in other cases, they can have both. Research objectives are the purpose and direction of the research. And each research question should have a corresponding objective or objectives. So you will see here, these are just some examples 
Um, basically, I will not uh, go one by one, but basically research questions and objectives make the same statements, but just in different formats. Okay. Now on publishing your paper. When you have already defined your research questions and objectives and formulated your research design, you can proceed to data collection, analysis, and writing of research report. Actually, you do not need to wait for the completion of your research work to publish. You can write a paper based on your literature review and present it in a conference and publish it. Or after completion of your research, you can publish the findings. PhD students can take the following route for publishing research paper. The review of literature to find a gap can already be turned into a conference paper. And then when the research is completed, another paper can be produced to report the findings of the research. And out of these two conference papers, you can write two journal papers. This is actually the ideal, and this is the requirement of some universities of their PhD students. Uh, later, I will show you how I was able to come up with uh, two papers from my dissertation. There are different types of journal. There are the theoretical journals, which won't take any empirical study. They do not accept uh, papers that are about empirical findings because their focus is on theory building, on literature review and the theoretical process. Okay? The challenge here is that there is no standard approach in theory building. You have to develop your own approach. It's very customized to each of the paper. So as I said earlier, it's not easy for junior researchers or people who are not familiar with the body of literature. This is not recommended for PhD students. Another type of journal is the research finding journal, like California Management Review, Journal of Applied Psychology, um, International Review of Public Administration. These are journals that you are familiar with, you see it everywhere. And these are focused on the testing or exploration of propositions or hypotheses. For these types of journal, you should show how you conducted the empirical testing your findings and the practical implications of these findings. Another type of journal is the practitioner oriented journals, like uh, the Journal of Business Strategy, Leadership and Strategy, Slow and Management Review, and Harvard Business Review. These types of journal focus on managerial implications of research findings. They require fewer, fewer pages of report. And the style of writing is like you are talking to executives instead of scholars. So the focus here is not on really on the methodology, but more on the practical implications. Let me just have a drink. Okay, journals differ in terms of quality standards and impact. Journals that make an impact are indexed in Scopus, ISI, or the International Scientific Indexing, and SJR, or Scientific Journal Ranking. And the journal metrics are used to help authors decide where to submit their manuscript for 
publication. These are quantitative tools that measure the journal's quality and impact. So we will see here um, impact factor, which measures the average number of citations received by articles within a two-year window. Impact factor best quartile ranks the journals. Um, the five-year impact factor uh, measures the number of citations within a five-year window. Site score scopus over a four-year period. Site score best quartile again ranks uh, according to scopus subject category. Uh, SNIP, the number of citations. SJR, also citations in one year divided by the number of articles published in the journal the previous three years. So there are many um, citation metrics, but each metric has its limitations. So you should never consider them in isolation. You can look at a number of metrics to really see the impact of a journal. Okay. Now, how do you publish in Scopus? Scopus is the largest abstract and citation database of peer-reviewed literature, including scientific journals, books and conference proceedings. It delivers a comprehensive overview of the world's research output in the fields of science, technology, medicine, social sciences, and arts and humanities. It is recognized widely by academic scholars and research professionals from around the world. They have high standards to maintain, and as a result, they only accept research studies that are of the highest quality. So getting papers published in Scopus Journal is not easy. The first step to gaining the attention of top-notch journals is to make sure that the work is authentic, entirely original, and contains breakthrough insights and findings. To do this, one has to carry out and conduct groundbreaking research work by having outstanding objectives that are exceptional and not ordinary. Now, after you have made sure that your research work has turned out as intended, you will have to focus on writing a world-class research article, paper, or report. And you can do this by reading Scopus articles published in the past. So you can get familiar with it. It will be also useful to seek advice from published authors. And keeping all these factors in mind, you can set out a plan to structure, format, and edit your paper. This is the general structure for writing an academic journal article. So it is basically a condensation of your research into around 10 to 15 pages. Some journals require around 5,000 words, others 8,000 to 10,000 words. So you will have to write your paper according to these requirements. When writing your research paper, you have to be intentional about writing for the journal of your choice. First thing is you will have to check the instructions for authors and the aims and scope of the journal that you would like to submit to. Because this will tell you whether they accept the type of article that you're thinking of writing and what requirements they have around it. Do they prefer case or quantitative study? Are they theoretical journal or practitioner oriented journal? You will have to consider these factors to determine if your research fits the journal and to adjust your style of writing.
how to write a journal article. First, you get to know the journal you want to submit to, as I explained earlier. And then you keep your message focused. When writing your article, you have to consider your target audience. Are you writing for a more general audience or experts in the same field as you? Or are you writing for executives in case you are submitting to a practitioner oriented journal? The journal you have chosen will give you more information on the type of audience that will read your work. Focus on your main message to keep attention of your readers. And then the next is you create a logical framework. The structure of your journal paper is just as important as the content itself. It helps to guide the reader through in a clear way. Individual journals will have their own specific formatting requirements. Uh, which, as I said, you can find in the instructions for authors. But a large number of journals now offer format free submission. Um, so you can submit your paper without formatting. So that eases the burden of the author. Okay. Next is be aware of the other literature in your field and reference it. Make sure to tell your reader how your article relates to key work that is already published. But this doesn't mean that you have to review every piece of previous relevant literature. You just need to show how you are building on previous work to avoid accidental plagiarism. And try to use current development, current literature. Although, of course, you can cite older ref references, but just make sure it is clear why you have chosen it. And lastly, be original. Again, communicate your unique point of view to stand out. Uh, you may be building on a concept already in existence, but you still need to have something new to say. So make sure you say it convincingly and fully understand and reference what has gone before the previous studies. Clarity is key. Make your writing accessible by using clear language. Writing that is easy to read is easier to understand too. And then write for a global audience if you want to reach the widest readership. And write your journal with confidence to give your reader certainty in your research. Make sure that you have described your methodology and approach, and don't forget to explain acronyms when they first appear. I'd like to show you this video about the four A's of writing a journal article from Taylor and Francis, a reputable publisher. Okay. Sharing. Can you see the screen that I'm sharing? Yes. yes. Can you hear it? Yes, you can run your presentation. All right planning to write a journal article, bear in mind the four A's, aims, audience, awareness of existing work, and articulating ideas clearly. When it comes to aims, the publication of articles is crucial for your career. They can secure funding, and more importantly, enhance your reputation and status, and that of your institution. On a wider global scale, publication is vital. It's how we further knowledge. Results can be used, tested, and potentially influence and change policy. Identify your audiences. You'll need to adapt and vary the way you talk about your research depending on the people you're targeting. 
for example, policymakers, fellow researchers, or a lay audience. Importantly, you'll need to consider where to publish to reach this audience. There are numerous journals with very specialized scope. This might be within the discipline, community of practice, or geographical region. Always be aware of existing work and put yours in this context to anchor and frame your arguments. This could be in relation to existing published research, political debates, or current policy issues, for example. Referencing the work of others when you cite them or quote them directly is essential. Plagiarizing or self-plagiarism, which is the redundant reuse of your own work, usually without proper citation, can damage your reputation and the journal you publish in. Articulate your ideas using a clear structure with a logical development across the sections. With your future readers in mind, make sure you write clearly and concisely, sticking to the journal's word limit. A top tip is to leave writing the introduction and conclusion until the end, when you'll know your key messages and points. The good news is there's lots of help out there, make the most of it. Ask fellow students, early career researchers or a senior colleague for peer review. Conferences or workshops can also be helpful. You can find lots of useful advice and resources on the Taylor & Francis Author Services website. Always keep in mind the sense of pride you'll get when your article is published. It makes all the struggles to get over the finish line well worthwhile. Enjoy the moment. Okay. All right, so let me continue. Articles, yes, yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paitun. So articles submitted to a journal goes through the process of peer review to assess the quality of a manuscript before it is published. You may ask how many reviewers are there? Usually there are at least two reviewers for each article, or it can even be more, sometimes five or six. So when a manuscript is submitted to a journal, it is assessed to see if it meets the criteria for submission. So it goes through the first uh, phase, the technical screening. If it passes the technical screening, the editorial team will select potential peer reviewers within the field uh, to peer review the manuscript and make recommendations. The peer review process can be either single blind, double blind, open, or transparent. I hope you see the screen clearly, the text, but I will just explain. So for single blind, the reviewers know the names of the authors, but the authors do not know who reviewed their manuscript. For double blind, the reviewers do not know the names of the authors, and the authors do not know who reviewed their manuscript. Open peer, the authors know who the reviewers are and the reviewers know who the authors are. If the manuscript is accepted, the name reviewer reports are published alongside the article and the author's response to the reviewer. For transparent peer, the reviewers know the names of the authors, but the authors do not know who reviewed their manuscript unless the reviewer chooses to sign their report. So different journals use different types of peer review, and you can find out which peer review system is used by a particular journal in the journals about page. But the journals indexed by Scopus, ISI, and SJR use double-blind review process. So what do reviewers look for in an article? First, originality. I have explained that earlier. Again, next, connection to theory. Also, if an article or a research lacks theoretical foundation, it will not be acceptable to the reviewers. An example here is you know, consulting firms, right? They conduct surveys to explore an issue or a problem. They have a framework, framework to do that, but they do not have theoretical foundation to support the framework. And they may come up with an empirical finding, but it is not acceptable as an academic research. This theoretical connection is something that differentiates us 
as robust academic scholars from industry consultants. All right. Reviewers also look whether the methodolo methodology is reliable. And of course, they look at the quality of writing and then the connection to practice. Your article should clearly show the implications to practice of your research finding. And then lastly, significant contribution. This is very important to quality journals. Significant contribution could be a continuous progress of current domain thinking, such as, as I said earlier, a new variable or factor, or challenging current domain thinking. I will give you some examples of that. This is an article that I published in 2019 together with Professor Bunanan in search of the Holy Grail in public service, a study on the mediating effect of public service motivation on organizational politics and outcomes. So the research problem is how do highly motivated government employees react to the potentially adverse effects of political perception on organizational commitment, job satisfaction, and workplace stress. And this is anchored on three theoretical underpinnings, social exchange theory, PSM theory, or public service motivation theory, and job demands resources theory. The significant contribution to literature is that it introduced a new variable, perception of organizational politics, or POP, in the study of PSM. Right? So this is an example of uh, an addition, a uh, continuous progress. The next example is this one toward an organizational theory of sustainability vision by Dr. Kantabutra. Um, the research problem is to fill in a fundamental gap in the corporate sustainability literature. The theoretical underpinnings on corporate sustainability theory and vision theory. The contribution is that it advances a theory of organizational vision into a coherent theory of sustainability vision. So this, this type of research challenges the current domain thinking. Now, what do you do after submitting your article? You wait. The hardest part maybe is the waiting part. Yeah? It, it may make you feel anxious. You know, with, with Dr. Um, will agree with me, but yeah, it may make you feel anxious, but do not be wor too worried. Just wait. Waiting can be within three months, six months, or even longer. While waiting, you can check your journal's online submission portal for updates because the status changes. You know, if it's ready under review, you can see that. If after sometimes, say, three months and there's no change in the status, you can follow up with, with the editor because the editor uh, directly, usually directly communicates with the author. Okay, so check your emails for related notifications. And when the results come, it might not be outright approval yet, but a request for some revisions. So you will have to revise your article upon, according to their recommendations and resubmit. Now, what if the article is rejected? Uh, please remember that submitting to Scopus Index Journal may have more rejections than approvals. Nobody likes rejection, right? When you have spent a lot of time and effort on your paper, uh, having it rejected is going to hurt. 
a manuscript can be rejected for all manner of reasons from and oversight to just simply falling outside of the journal scope. So what can be the typical reasons? One, the manuscript fails the technical screening. The technical screening uh, would be, you know, checking on the suggested elements of plagiarism. If the paper has like more than 15% of similarity with other work, then it will be rejected. Okay. The paper is maybe under review at another journal. This is not allowed because submission to multiple journals at the same time is not allowed by, by all journals. Actually, it should be just one submission. The quality of the language is not sufficient for review to take place, and the paper doesn't conform to the journal's author guidelines. So these are the things that are reviewed during technical screening. Other reasons for rejection could be that the manuscript does not fall within the journal's aims and scope. So if the paper won't be of interest or value to the audience, it's unlikely to be accepted. Another reason could be that the research topic isn't of great enough significance. So it will not be interesting in maybe because the paper's findings do not advance the field or that the manuscript is just part of a larger study which has been divided up to make as many articles as possible. Or it could also be that the research is over ambitious. If the authors have been overly ambitious, the results may be you know, difficult to interpret or maybe even flawed. And in these cases, it may be more appropriate to divide the work into a series of smaller research projects. Another reason, and this is really fatal, if a clear hypothesis has, hasn't been established, the question behind the research may be unclear, poorly formulated, or not relevant to the research field. So carrying out an extensive literature review can help guide your hypothesis or research question. Or it could be other reason the manuscript is incomplete. The paper might contain observations, but it is not a full study, or it may ignore or overlook other important work in the field. There, it could be that there are flaws in the procedure, presentation, or analysis of the data, such as non-conformity with recognized procedures or methodology, or the lack of statistically valid analysis. Other reason for rejection could be flaws in the manuscript's arguments and conclusions, because the argument should be logical, structured, and valid, and supports the conclusions reached by the paper. And lastly, the language and structure of the paper need to be of good enough quality else it will be rejected. Okay. So after rejection, what to do next? The work you put into your paper submission is not wasted. You have to think about this as part of just your academic publishing journey and use any feedback that you receive for the next version of the paper. Okay, so say the paper was not was found to be not a good fit for the journal. Typically, the best next step is to reevaluate which other journals you can submit to. But first, you have to try to understand why your article was not a good fit. And if there were substantive issues found in some areas of the paper, the example, maybe the methodology was not appropriate or the research question post or the discussion findings did not reflect the reported results, it is better to first attempt to address these substantive issues 
before trying to submit to another journal. So you can seek some expert feedback on your paper and see if you can strengthen the areas of the paper that were seen as weak or not fully developed. If your paper was rejected because the contribution uh, to the field is not evident, then this is problematic and you may need to closely reevaluate your research. If plagiarism was found, as I said, more than 15% of the text similar to other work will likely lead to a decision to reject. So you have to carefully cite all references. There's actually also tendency to plagiarize oneself if you are writing a second or third article. So do not forget to cite properly, even if it is your own work. And if there are too many writing errors, seek support to correct them. If English is not your first language, you can use a professional service to help your uh, editing of the paper. Okay. Now, what if you receive a reject and resubmit decision? This is similar to revise and resubmit, okay? So this is a positive uh, result. This decision typically indicates that the editor saw potential value in the topic or idea for your article, but does not believe that it has been fully developed yet, either conceptually or in writing. So you can resubmit a revised and more fully developed paper to the same journal. It's a better option, especially if you have received this decision from a top tier journal. And you get expert advice on how to approach a revision of the paper and whether you need to further develop your research study. As you do your literature review, you will get acquainted with journals that are in line with your research topic. So when I was conducting my own research work, I referred a number of articles from this journal, International Journal of Public Administration or IJPA. So when I completed my research and was ready to write my paper, I look up this journal to learn more about it and see if I can write a paper that will be a good fit to them. I also check the journal metrics. Some students would publish with any international journal that would accept their work, even if they are not quality journals just to graduate. But if you are thinking of your long-term career goals, it would be more beneficial to publish in a quality journal. Of course, it requires more effort, careful planning, and commitment. These quartiles rank journals from highest to lowest based on their impact factor or impact index. Q1, green, is top 25 of journals in the list. Q2, 25 to 50. Q3, 50 to 75. Q4, 75 to 100. So you will see in this uh, diagram, IJPA is ranked in two areas public administration and business and international management from 2007 to 2020. And for the past three years, 2018 to 2020, it has received a quartile two ranking, meaning it's in the top 25 to 50%. In one research project, you may come up with more than one paper. For my research on public service motivation, I was able to write and publish two papers, these two. My research studied six variables, okay? 
PSM or Public Service Motivation, POP, Perception of Organizational Politics, Workplace Trust, Commitment, Stress, and Job Satisfaction. So those are six variables. In this first article, which I published in 2019, I included the findings on the relationship between only five variables, not including workplace trust. And then this second article, I presented a different angle of the findings, focusing on workplace trust. So this is one of the strategies to be able to come up with more papers from your research. If you explored or tested a number of variables like five or six, you don't have to write about all of them in one paper. You can actually write a paper discuss discussing the findings for every research question. You just have to be careful not to plagiarize yourself and make sure that the next paper is not just a rehash of the previous one, okay? Now, these are some tips for conducting research for those of you who are currently uh, conducting your research work. It is very important that you formulate your research questions carefully. As I mentioned earlier, this is where your whole research work will anchor to your research questions and theories. Next, do not be over ambitious with your research. Doing a comparative study between two countries or two industries may sound interesting, but if you are a PhD student and need to finish within a limited time, you limit your study to a smaller scope, maybe just one country or one sector. Um, when I was uh, starting with my dissertation, I was actually thinking of doing a comparative study you know, between Philippines and Thailand, since I thought I am here and I have access also to data in the Philippines. So it would be interesting and I can publish a number of papers from that. But I was advised by Professor Boon Anan that uh, this is too big. Um, I may not be able to finish this in two, three years. So yeah, do not be very ambitious unless, I mean, you have proper funding and you have time to do that, you know, but not for PhD study. Okay, next is you have to do extensive review of literature. Maybe you have to read 50 articles, okay? And in Reviewing literature, you have to be systematic, okay? You write in Excel sheet the list of your literature with authors, name, and the year published for easy referencing. And this is also the way you can write the file name of your references when you save them. So when you go back, you know, to your to the articles that you have to refer to, it's easier. Also, along the way of your literature review, you will find new variables or concepts that you can build on. So be open to changing your research questions. But this should be before you proceed to the methodology and data collection. It is very difficult to change when you are already you know, far off. So while doing the literature review, to assess if you will want to change or your topic or you will want to um, add more variables, that is where you will see it, not during the methodology and data collection. Okay. When thinking of your topic, you also, said also consider if you will have to access or if you will have the access to data when you do your data collection. You should already consider that even during, you know, um, formulating your research question. 
because it will be very problematic when you have a very uh, good proposal, but when you are already on the field collecting data, you cannot access the data that you need. Okay. Next, when thinking of your topic, you also can ah no, that's number five. Data collection will be challenging. Not can be, it will be. So you have to use your network, all social media platforms, not only survey platforms like Google Survey or Monkey Survey. You will have to use your resources on the ground okay, to collect data. And when doing your data analysis, if necessary, you can get a statistician statistical analysis, but you have to work with him or her closely to make sure that it is aligned with your methodology. And then when you have already the data analysis results, look for findings that are interesting, new, and contribute to knowledge and highlight this in your discussion. Many journals look for more complex analysis, like using the SEM or sequential equation modeling, not just a simple correlational analysis. So try to do well. Uh, I think this is also kind of expected of the students to do more complex analysis. So you have a, a bigger uh, question, research question than master students, you know. And you target to submit an article for publication at least four months before your final defense. You don't wait for your final defense to finish to write an article. You should be writing an article already. <laughs> At least four months because it takes a long time to get published to have your paper approved and with NIDA I understand you cannot graduate without being published right so you should have a lead time if you want to graduate on time and lastly you have to work closely with your advisor um, PhD students are at a higher level, right? So advisors are there to guide. We cannot expect the advisors to uh, spoon feed us. And when you talk to your advisor, make sure that you have something to show. So like with Professor Bun Anand, I don't see her if I don't have maybe 30 pages more added to my research, to my paper. So every time I see her, I have maybe one chapter finished or two chapters. You cannot go to the advisor very often and ask for advice. You also have to do, you know, uh, individual study and um, act like a professional, like a PhD student. All right. Um, yeah. So that's all, I guess, uh, the tips for conducting research based. And these are my ref references. So that's the end of my presentation. If uh, my lecture, uh, we can now open the floor for question and answer. Yes. yes. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Robina. Uh, it's a very helpful presentation. I think that uh, everyone now can understand more about the way to write the research and get information uh, about international publication in uh, Scopa Journal. Uh, for those who cannot catch up with our talk, I would like to give a short summary. I think now the participants uh, already know what types of research they are writing now uh, 
the three types of research, research driven research and problem driven research and literature derives research. And there are three types you should know when you are writing your research. And the original research uh, will provide knowledge, uh, new knowledge for you. Uh, she also tell you that you should try to uh, connect your idea and um, so I think um, it is important for uh, the uh, researcher and she also uh, tell us about the research process. There are eight steps to uh, conduct the research. I think uh, and the important thing that she tell us that the good research should meet your your cost that you are studying or uh, should meet your goals and clear question and objective in uh, your research. And the research topic become uh, a more gap uh, from the gap of research and uh, you should uh, look at the uh, specific uh, you are in the area that you, you already know and you can enter into that area to uh, correct your uh, data to analyze it. Um, and we also tell us the about the research objects objectives that is the direction uh, for our research. It is important and regarding the publication uh, publications. Um, we know more about the types of journals. Uh, uh, for example, theological journals like a uh, literature review, theological process, and other types about the research finding journals like uh, uh, analytic or testing the results to uh, uh, for, for publication. And the last types of journal is uh, practitioners oriented journals like a business strategy, for example. Uh, she also tell us about uh, public uh, in high impact uh, or high citation index. I think we should uh, study more uh, from your uh, primary information for a good publication. And I think now, all participants already know about the scope, and it can help uh, us to improve uh, our academic writing skill. I think if we try to publish in scope journal, I think uh, the researcher can improve their uh, ability, their skill to uh, further uh, research. And we already know how to write the journal article techniques. Uh, technique get, no, uh, keep, create, and uh, to be, it get is the get to know the journal we want to publish and keep uh, our message focused and create logical framework. And uh, we should be aware of other researchers and we importantly, we should be original because it is important uh, to peer review to accept our uh, articles. I think now we are uh, know that the clarity is, is the key point uh, of our uh, international uh, research writings. Uh, Dr. Rowena also tell us uh, that uh, we now uh, know that the uh, Sakopat use the double bright in the peer review, so we should carefully, carefully in writing. And if I think if we know already is about the condition of the uh, peer review, I think is uh, we have more chance to be uh, except for publications. I think it is important, and uh, we already know about the reason that why they will be rejected. So I think uh, if we know the reason that they will be rejected, it can uh, help us to prevent uh, the uh, problems to, to, to reject us. Like uh, similarity to other journals is the key point 
uh, that's a peer review concern and the topics. Uh, if it not case enough, you choose improve your topics and you choose clear in your hypothesis and uh, the language and writing should be good enough for the uh, international publication. Uh, the final is uh, she tell us about the tip for conducting for more understanding and I think that today we uh, have more knowledge from our presentation so I think uh, now it's time for our participant to uh, raise your, your question. Any, anyone have any question? Okay. Oh, Are there any questions? Okay. Excuse me, I have a question. Hello, listen to me. Okay, um, for me, oh, my name is Kanya Pat. I would like to uh, ask a little bit for a uh, uh, research question. I think research question is very important. I think for a good research question, it like a flexible, interesting, uh, novel, uh, ethical, relevant, and uh, Dr. Rowena, uh, you think is anything more? Yes. Um, as I mentioned, the research question, uh, what you said are all correct. And as I explained earlier, the Goldilocks test, and the most important is it should be original. original. Yeah. And uh, because the research questions will be derived from your research topic, right? So make sure that the research questions is, are original and by what I mean original is that you can uh, derive new knowledge or new in insights from your research question. This is not a research question that has been addressed or solved before. Okay, thank you so much. Are there any more questions? Um, excuse me. May Dr. Rowena, good, good evening. Uh, I just would like to ask because you mentioned that one of the reasons for the article rejection is that article is part of the bigger project. And uh, I'm actually confused because towards the end of your presentation, you mentioned that you published two articles from your own big project. Oh, yes. Actually, by big, I mean really big. Like a big project is something that compares, like a comparative study, comparing maybe public service motivation in Thailand and in the Philippines. That's big. But my article is not that big. It just composed of Six variables. Six. Yeah. And that's why I was able to come up with two articles out of that. Oh, okay. Thank you. 